In this lesson, we're going to cover some of the key utilities we want to use to troubleshoot our TCP IP configuration. Now, the first one I've actually already showed in previous lessons, and that's the ipconfig command. So ipconfig shows you information such as your IP address, your subnet mask, your gateway, and all of the adapters on your system. I can also use the slash all switch. This now gives you a lot more information about the machine, including things such as its physical MAC address, such as the DNS servers, the DHCP server that was used, and really just more information to try and troubleshoot the system. But it does more than just give you information. DNS is a key part of IP communication, domain name services. And essentially, if you think about that 13 Baker Street was my IP address, well, I don't really use IP addresses very often. When I'm searching a website, I just type in www.cnn.com, for example. Well, think of that really as its host name. So that would be like John Savile as the name of the house. So when we try and communicate with systems, we have to convert its name, our friendly name, to its IP address. So that's what DNS does. So every time we try and access an address behind the scenes, our computer first translates that host name, that DNS name, to an IP address which then gets converted to a MAC address for our communication. So ipconfig can actually show us that DNS cache because rather than contact the DNS server every time we try and translate a host name to an IP address, once it's done that lookup once, it caches it locally to be more efficient in the future. So I can actually look at those entries. Here are some of the entries it's got in its cache. Now, perhaps at some point, something has changed. A server has changed to a new IP address, but I still have an invalid entry in my DNS cache. I can flush this cache out. So I've now emptied my cache. At this point, though, if I try to, for example, ping a server, you can see now it has that entry back in its cache. So this is a good way for me to actually help troubleshoot. Well, what is the IP address I'm trying to use connecting to a host? Maybe it's wrong. I can flush out that cache. Additionally, if I'm using DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, I can actually use ipconfig to release that IP address I have and even renew it. For example, I can type ipconfig slash renew, and that will go and talk to the current DHCP server it's using and request to extend its lease, so renew that IP address lease. You can see succeeded. If I wanted to actually give up my IP address, I can type ipconfig slash release. This will then release that current lease it has on an IP address and then go out of the network and request a new IP address from the HTTP server. So when I'm talking about communicating to other servers, another big test I want to perform is, well, can I even talk to that other server? So you notice I've used ping quite a few times. This comes from the old sonar of submarines. And basically the way this works is I give it a machine, so I'm giving it a host name. I could also use IP address. And this basically sends out a packet over the ICMP protocol. And the whole point is that other machine will echo that packet back, confirming I can communicate with it. Now on that target machine, it is important that it accepts those echo requests. Now these won't work for machines on the internet. Most internet machines will actually reject those because they can be used as part of a denial of service attack. But if I go in here, and in your internal systems, you may want to enable this for this type of testing. I actually go to file and printer sharing, echo request. So you enable these for IPv4, and there's also an IPv6 version. So then I can ping those machines to test that connectivity. So ping is going to be one of those first things you try. If I think maybe I can't communicate with a server, the same wrong with a service, well, can I even talk to it first? Also, you may even try pinging your local IP address, 127.0.0.1, is always your own machine. This just tests your local TCP IP stack is functioning correctly. The next command that's very useful to try is trace route. So trace route actually shows me, remember we talked about there were different gateways to get from my machine to maybe a box on the internet. There are many different hops it's going to have to take to get to that server. So trace route will actually go and work out, well, how do I get from where I am right now to actually that final server? So it's going to bounce all the different gateways on the internet, on my network, 
Now notice it's also trying to do a ping. So machines on the internet, they're not gonna respond to those pings, so they will just time out. And certain hops on the way may also not time out or give you the information. But this is a great way, particularly internally in your network, to try and work out, well, how am I actually getting between these servers? Likewise, there's an extension to this, PathPing. And PathPing is very similar, but it's now also doing a more in-depth ping between each of the different hops to make sure that communication functions. So different commands to test, hey, can I get to where I'm going and how is it getting there? I also talked before about the root command. So root print, for example, shows us all the different routes we have in the network between my machine and everyone else. And you can see that for any address, for any mask, my gateway is my 192.168.1.1. So this shows me that's my default gateway. But I can additionally have other routes added to my system. For example, you can see here that 127.001, net mask of all ones, which means only for that one IP address, well, it obviously goes to itself. So there are just some routes added specifically on my machine. You can see, for example, my own IP address also has a net mask of all ones. It goes to myself. But I can add additional routes in here if I needed to for specific routing for specific hosts. I already showed you the ARP command. For example, ARP to look at my MAC address cache in the system. Another gate command is netstat. So next, that will actually show me all of the current connections and listeners I have on my system. So when we talked about TCP, many types of service use a specific port. It's a well-known port. For example, web traffic always listens on port 80 for HTTP, so unencrypted. Encrypted HTTPS always listens on port 443. POP3, for example, uses port 110. SMTP, for example, to send mail traffic, always uses port 25, and the list goes on. A socket is basically connection from my machine through to one of these well-known ports or to any other port that a service is being offered on. So this is actually showing all the different connections I currently have from my machine to other machines. Also, it's showing me the ports that I'm listening on for specific types of service. For example, if I was to run this command on a machine that was offering web services, for example, you notice I have a lot more connections on this machine. So what I'll actually do, rather than having to scroll all the way up, I can actually do a search. I can say, well, find me all the things that I'm actually listening on, for example. So I can say netstat, I'll get the name, and this time I'm gonna pipe it on the command lines. This is just piping strings, but I can say find listening. So it's only showing me the ones that are listening. And here we'll see, for example, I'm listening on port 443, so I'm offering a web service. So this is great to just check the connections I have and what port listeners I may have going on on my system. I've also already shown a very useful tool previously, and really that was the network monitor. So one of the great things about the network monitor is the ability to show all the traffic passing over a system. So this is my network monitor tool. I've opened a new capture tab, and I can say start. So this is now capturing all the traffic going over the network that this machine can see. So for example, if I went back to my test machine and maybe I did a test lookup, savdal fso1, it gets me a response. Now behind the scenes, that's actually sending network traffic over here. So if I stop this, these are all the packets that I can see. I'm now gonna apply a DNS filter to only show me DNS records. And here we can see my workstation machine made a request to my domain controller. We can actually look in details of the packet so I can see the raw content of the packet and I can see the query information. So what was they actually asking for? So it's actually here you can see who is FSO1. Who is FSO1 for the IPv4 protocol? So it asked for IPv4 and it asked for IPv6. And you'll see there's basically a query and then there's a response success. So here it actually sends it back. Here is the host record telling me the IP address. So this is a fantastic tool for really diagnosing what's going on over the network. And this is a free download. So if you just search for network monitor, you'll actually find the link to download this. And it's a Microsoft tool. You can also, for example, actually jump back to a server. 
If I right click on my open network adapters, change adapter settings, you can right click and say status. This will actually give you some basic information about that link, the traffic going over it, for example, how busy it is, the details of that connection. Another nice tool for overall system monitoring that does give you some information about the network as well is Task Manager. We have this overall performance and it will show us the traffic going on over the ethernet. So it's showing us the send and receive kilobits or might be megabits per second. But this open resource monitor lets me actually get even more information. Notice here I have a network tab. If I select this network tab, then it's gonna show me the actual processes with network activity. It's gonna show me how busy they are. It gives me an overall view of my connections. So again, this is a great place to go to get more information about what's going on on the network. The final tool I wanted to introduce is Telnet. So by default, this is not actually installed. So on a Windows 8 box, for example, I would have to go to my programs and features, turn a Windows feature on or off, and then we'll actually see Telnet client. So I want to install my Telnet client. It's going to apply those, and then I'll have the Telnet application. And I actually talked about this previously, and it's something you typically don't use anymore. We have graphical RDP connections. We have PowerShell for remoting. But Telnet can still be useful to try and connect to a specific port to test something. For example, if I wanted to test my email server, for example, maybe I think there's a problem with it. Or maybe I want to connect to a web port for some basic, hey, is it even communicating? Well, I can actually say, for example, I want to connect to port 25, which is the SMTP port. So I'm now connected to that mail server. I can then type commands to actually try and communicate and make sure it's working. The fact that I've already seen this mail service ready means it is listening on that port 25 and responding. But I can say hello to it. It can then give me some basic information about that email server. And in my case, I'm just going to quit out of that. Yes, that looks good. I could communicate. So remember Telnet and the ability to actually pass it a specific port number can be very useful to test. Is a service even there? And is it listening? So we've covered some of the basic tools. There are certainly many, many more. And I would certainly encourage you to experiment with these. All of these tools I've showed, a lot of them have switches. Ping, for example, I can say, well, carry on pinging, ping 50 times, show me different information. So look at the help for each of those utilities and experiment. NetStack can give me information about the process names, in addition to just showing me the basic port numbers, etc. So experiment with these commands. Ping will be one of your best friends. IP config will be one of them. The network monitor is very, very useful, but you'll find you'll use all of them at some point in your career. So experiment, get to know them, and this concludes our lesson on TCP troubleshooting.